All right, fellas, today let's take a look at the April Revolution in Afghanistan and the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. Now, the predominant portrayal of Afghanistan for the last couple decades has been one of Islamic radicals, warlords, and drug cartels. Sadly, these issues and many others are a very real fact of life within the nation. This, however, was not always the case and had things transpired differently would not be the case today. Understanding the April Revolution and its overthrow are necessary to understand the situation in Afghanistan, so let's begin with some context. The landholding system in Afghanistan into the 20th century was still mostly feudal. 75% of land was owned by 3% of the rural population. The relationship between the Soviets and the Afghan people actually goes all the way back to the start of the Soviet Union who greatly assisted in launching infrastructure projects such as power plants as well as hosting thousands of Afghan students in their schools and universities for the duration of the 1920s, as well as building a polytechnic school in the 1960s. Afghanistan has been nicknamed the Graveyard of Empires for a reason. Its location is one of great strategic importance, connecting Central and South Asia, leading to countless empires, occupiers, and even the native tribes fighting for dominance of the nation. Throughout the world, the late 1960s saw widespread movements and protests, Afghanistan being among the many nations affected. The PDPA, or the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, was founded on the first day of the year in 1965. Contrary to popular belief, the PDPA did indeed have popular support, even in the rural areas of the nation. In 1973, the 40-year reign of Mohammad Zahir Shah was overthrown and the monarchy was abolished, with Mohammad Dawood Khan becoming president of Afghanistan, although his reign was similarly autocratic, corrupt, and unpopular. In April of 1978, the PDPA took power through a military coup prompted by the Dawood regime beginning to suppress the party as well as other opposition. The Dawood regime had a PDPA leader killed, arrested the rest of the leadership, and purged hundreds of suspected party sympathizers from government posts. Party leader Tariki was arrested around midnight of April 26. This possibility had been planned for, and by late afternoon the party had seized power. More than 200 tanks and armored vehicles were mobilized, as well as military officers who were party members taking command of ground and air troops. The party leader was released from jail, and the revolutionary forces emerged as victors. This was the April Revolution. When the PDPA took power, they had goals of a more equitable society, including the emancipation of women from traditional tribal bondage, equal rights for minorities, and wide-scale access of education, housing, and medical care for the general population. The overthrown regime was an oppressive, feudal one. Now, having gained power, the leaders looked to the Soviet Union as a model worth emulating. At the time of the revolution, the situation in Afghanistan was bleak. The PDPA was faced with an incredibly difficult task. Afghanistan was among the poorest nations globally, and ranked among the lowest in many categories such as education and healthcare. It had an average life expectancy of 40 years, and an infant mortality rate of 25%. 86% of the population resided in rural areas, and a significant portion of this rural population, around 8%, also led nomadic lives. Only 5% of the nation was literate, and only 12% of land was suitable for crops, but less than half of it was actually cultivated due to the lack of water and feudal inefficiency. Not one village had electricity, and as one might expect, industry within the nation was very, very weak, with not a single railway in place, not to mention the very oppressive rural culture. The PDPA quickly worked to implement much-needed radical reforms. Industry was nationalized, with many sectors tripling in percentage of national income. Peasant debts to landlords were entirely abolished. Marriage reforms were implemented as well as an age of consent. Land was distributed and collective farming began to take hold. A campaign to eradicate illiteracy was also begun with both adults and children learning how to read, and equal rights for women, as well as women-specific rights like maternity leave, were established. Women's co-ops were formed where they could earn decent wages and have a say in their work for the first time. A minimum marriage age was established and forced marriages were made illegal. Women also even held leading government positions like Minister of Education, and half of all university students were women. A hundred new factories were built in five years, and available doctors increased by almost 50%.
Price controls and reductions were implemented for key foods. Aid was also given to nomadic people who wished to live a settled life. A minimum wage was established, as was a progressive income tax. In May 1979, British political scientist Fred Halliday stated that probably more has changed in the countryside over the last year than in two centuries since the state was established. The socialist government also mobilized to stop the growth of opium poppy, of which Afghanistan supplied 70% of the world's supply. Regardless, the deep-rooted social, economic, and physical issues of the nation proved to be fundamental problems. Rural reactionary forces launched attacks, especially at schools and teachers. Feudal landlords opposed the reform programs that distributed their property. Fundamentalists and tribesmen stood against the moves towards gender equality and education. Soon after, the US, alongside with the Saudis and Pakistanis, quickly got to work to intervene with the revolution long before the Soviets ever came into the picture, weaponizing and fueling Islamic radicals to fight, a decision that still haunts the region and many nations today. In an interview with President Carter's national security advisor, the following was said. The former director of the CIA, Robert Gates, stated in his memoirs that American intelligence services began to aid the Mujahideen in Afghanistan six months before the Soviet intervention. In this period, you were the national security advisor to President Carter. You therefore played a role in this affair, is that correct? Brzezinski replied, Yes. According to the official version of history, CIA aid to the Mujahideen began in 1980, that is to say, after the Soviet army invaded Afghanistan, on the 24th of December 1979. But the reality, secretly guarded until now, is completely otherwise. Indeed, it was July 3rd of 1979 that President Carter signed the first directive for secret aid to the opponents of the pro-Soviet regime in Kabul. And that very day, I wrote a note to the president in which I explained to him that in my opinion, this aid was going to induce a Soviet military intervention. In August 1979, a State Department report stated, The United States' larger interests would be served by the demise of the Tariki Amin regime, despite whatever setbacks this might mean for the future social and economic reforms in Afghanistan. But to the US, this was a price worth paying. It would make the Soviets bleed. A lot. At the request of the Afghan government in December of 1979, the Soviets staged a military intervention to provide desperately needed support in the fight against the US-backed Mujahideen and mercenaries. The Soviets knew the risk involved in this operation and only agreed after repeated and frantic requests for help by the Afghan government. I'll link one such example in the comments as well as more in the description. The Soviet Prime Minister told the Afghan leader, the entry of our troops into Afghanistan would outrage the international community, triggering a string of extremely negative consequences in many different areas. Our common enemies are just waiting for the moment when Soviet troops appear in Afghanistan. This will give them the excuse they need to send armed bands into the country. This move was purposely done not only to trip the newly emerging Afghan revolution, but also to trap the Soviets into their own Vietnam War. The Mujahideen were showered with money, training, and weapons with the war costing the Soviets around $5 billion a year. The US and Saudi Arabia spent around $40 billion in total on the war. Not only did they support existing forces, but they actively recruited, supplied, trained, and transported around 100,000 Mujahideen from 40 predominantly Muslim nations. 15,000 came from Saudi Arabia alone, Osama bin Laden being among these. Within two years of the CIA's arrival, the Pakistan-Afghanistan border once again became the biggest producer of heroin in the world. And when the thousands of recruited Mujahideen returned to their various home countries, they took the US-provided training, finances, and supplies with them and put them to use, and spread them, leading to the modern rise of global terrorism beginning in the 90s and continuing today. Professor of Middle East Studies, Ekbal Ahmed states, the propaganda in the West suggests that violence and holy war are inherent in Islam. The reality is that, as a worldwide movement, jihad is a recent phenomenon. Without significant exception during the 20th century, jihad was used in a national, secular, and political context, that is, until the advent of the anti-Soviet war in Afghanistan. The war proved largely unsuccessful for the Soviets, and they pulled out in early 1989. After the exit of the Soviets, the Afghan government managed to last about three more years, even outlasting the Soviet Union itself by a year. 
But in the end, it fell, and with it, all the social and economic progress that had been made, with the US consciously pushing the nation and its people back into their struggle to further the goals of the US. The Afghan people were left with more than a million dead, 3 million disabled, and 5 million refugees, altogether amounting to half the population. Power in Afghanistan was seized by the Taliban, and the US would later begin its 20-year war in the nation after the very forces they trained launched a terror attack on US soil. Once they seized power, the Mujahideen fought each other, with the Taliban filling the power vacuum. Cities and civilians fell victim to looting and mass executions alongside the return of oppressive customs. Rape was used as intimidation and even rewarding soldiers. Those accused of being thieves had a hand cut off. Music was banned alongside any hint of secular education. Men were to have untrimmed beards and women were to wear the burqa, which entirely covered them. Women were completely cut off from any education and non-household work, while those deemed immoral were stoned to death. Somewhere under the ruins of today's Afghanistan was the possibility of a different and better future. Had the US left the Marxist government of Afghanistan undisturbed, there would not be the global rise in terrorism, the oppression experienced by the Afghan people, the 9-11 attacks, the war in Afghanistan, and the decimation of the nation. This is not the first time the US has toppled a nation breaking away from capitalist hegemony, and in all such cases, the US has brought reactionary elements of society back into prominence, ruined the economy, and created pointless deaths and suffering. So that is a basic explanation of the April Revolution and the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. If you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, follow on Instagram, and join the subreddit. Uh, check out the community tab, and I'll see you guys later. Peace.